So today is lesson four. We're going to go over the requirements for assignment one. We're going to talk about client and server side input validation to make sure we don't get garbage from our input forms. And then the last part of class, we're going to introduce Git and GitHub. And we're going to spend some time working with those because we're going to be using Git and GitHub to submit all of your assignments moving forward from now until basically you're done here at Georgian. And probably a lot of your other instructors, some of your other instructors, um, probably going to have you use Git as well. Morning, Jake. Welcome. So let's go over assignment one first. You can find it in the assignments tab. Now, ordinarily, normally I only allocate a week for this assignment. Um, I've decided to give you two weeks to do it, which is loads of time. You have to build three pages. So three pages in 13 days is more than generous. So everybody should have the assignment submitted on time. Uh, really no reason with that amount of time being allocated. So it's basically for you to practice on your own, inserting and selecting data from the database, as well as validating inputs. And the assignment counts for 15% of your overall grade. It will be due um, in two weeks on Tuesday before our class uh, on Wednesday, the 24th. You have to submit two things on Blackboard. Um, morning, Nafise. You're gonna give me a link to your GitHub repository that has to be private and you can invite me. I will show you how to do all this today. And you also have to give me a list, a link to the pages on AWS. You're basically gonna to submit to me two links. Now I just finished marking this assignment in my other section and many students either only gave me the GitHub link or they only gave me the AWS server link. You must submit both, okay? When you invite me to a GitHub project, GitHub sends me an email but it doesn't tie it to your student record. GitHub doesn't know who you are as a student. So that's why you need both links submitted on Blackboard. So you're not gonna upload any files or code to Blackboard, you're just gonna give me two links, one on AWS and one from github.com. Um, this is an independent assignment, okay? You can't do the work with someone else and give me two versions of the same project. I actually spent part of my morning dealing with this in my other section already, where two students who actually live together gave me the same exact assignment. And I spent part of my morning creating academic misconduct forms, which is a not a very good use of my time. Okay? So you have to do your own project. It can't be the same as someone else's. If your project looks like it may not have been your own work, we will sit down for a meeting and you'll have to explain to me that it is your own work. Um, all of my files that we've been doing in class for our PHP gaming site, they are on GitHub and you can reference those, but they're, they're there for you to look at. <laughs> I know so many pets. My files are there for you to look at. You can't just download the code, change the words and give it back to me and ask me to give you a mark. Okay. It's there for a reference only. I've also built a sample application and if there's screenshots in this document, I'll show it to you. Please note, because one student, my other section didn't pay attention to this instruction. You can't build what's in the screenshot. It's just for demonstration purposes. You have to build something else, okay? So you can't just replicate the screenshots that I'm gonna go over in a minute. Lastly, I had to add this this semester because it was never a problem before. One of the other classes, many students, after they submitted their work, after the due date, they then went to GitHub and modified their code. Once you submit it, you can't make any changes to your project until after it's marked. Okay, Because in effect, you're getting more time if you do more work on the project after the submission deadline. So if you modify your code after it's been submitted, it's going to be an academic misconduct. That's just out of fairness, so everyone has the same amount of time to work on. So you are going to build, yes, Colton, you can make as many changes as you like to it, 
But GitHub, and I'm going to show you this, it timestamps all of your changes. So you can make however many changes you like, but you can't make changes past Tuesday, the 23rd of 5 o'clock. So you're going to build a mini three-page website. You can build anything you like. I've given you some examples here. But you can build something else, anything that interests you. If you like to cook, make a little recipe tracker. Um, if you're working out regularly, make an exercise log. I don't care what it is, as long as it's not the same as my sample. Okay. If you're stuck, I know for some students this is a challenge. Um, when you're tasked to build your own project, I prefer this method rather than saying everyone build the same thing. If you're stuck for ideas, please email me and I'm happy to help you come up with a project idea that you're happy with. Okay, it's not meant to be torture coming up with a project idea. So if you need help and you want someone to kick around some ideas with, by all means, I'm happy to make some other suggestions besides what's here. So you can't submit the PHP gaming site because we're doing that together and you can't submit my sample, which I will show you. So in your project, you're going to need to create two tables in your database. You guys are taking the database course with Mazir. By now, you should know how to create tables um, in MySQL. You're going to build a form like we've built in our PHP gaming site. We're going to do another example together in class today. And the form has to include a drop down list, and I'll explain why. You'll need to write code that we're going to do today to validate the user input. So for example, a user can't submit a blank form or they can't submit text data in a field where you want a number. You need to validate that. If the form inputs are good, you're going to save a new record to the database. And then in your last page, it's going to be basically what you did in lab one. You're going to query the database and output the data in an HTML table, just like you did with your relatives in lab one, which most people did successfully. Yes, Felix, you can use JavaScript. You don't really need to use JavaScript. You can validate with HTML5 in your form and PHP on your save page. And we're going to do this today and we'll look at why we need both. So you can use JavaScript, but it's not really necessary. In fact, using JavaScript for validation is probably more work. That's kind of the old way we had to validate forms. It was a lot of work. Okay, so you should add comments in your code. You don't have to do it on every line, but at least every section of code, you should put in a comment. This is what I'm doing here. You'll have two tables in the database, one that saves inputs from your form, and the other one that's used to populate your drop-down list. And again, we'll look at a sample in a minute, so this will be a little more clear. So your form has to have inputs for each field in the database. So if there's eight fields in your database table, you'll have eight inputs on your form. And you need at least one drop-down list that's populated from the other table in your database. And then you're going to use HTML5 or JavaScript if you want to, Felix, to validate the inputs. That's the first page, is your form. Your second page is your save page. It accepts the form post, from, verifies all the values, tells the user if anything, if they've missed anything or entered any invalid data. And if everything's correct, it's going to save the data to the database. And then your third page is what's going to look like lab one. It's just going to select all the data from that table and display it in an HTML table of rows and columns. You're going to upload all your work to AWS so that it runs live on the internet. You're going to publish it. And you're also going to upload all your code to a private GitHub repository. Private so nobody else can see your work, only you and me. So you have to invite me. Here's my GitHub username. IFOTN, it's short for in front of the net, which is my company name. So you need to add me as a collaborator. That way I will have access to see your code. And you need to make a minimum of four commits. So a commit is GitHub speak for a version. So you're not just going to upload the code when you're finished. 
you should be actively uploading your code as you're working on the assignment. And each version should have a descriptive name. And we'll go over this in class today. You're also going to build a readme file that describes the application and links to the live website. So here is a sample, and I can even show you a sample from my other class of what I'm looking for. So here's my form page. So in my database, I created a players table. And there was an ID, and then I had a have a first name, a last name, a number, and a position. And you can see the position is a dropdown. So not only do I have a players table, but I have a positions table. And the whole purpose of the positions table is just to fill this dropdown list. So when I'm adding a player, I can choose a position from a list rather than just typing in any position I want. So when I fill out the form properly, it should save to the database. So here's my save page. And then my third page is like lab one, it just displays a list of all of the records in the players table. So you can't build a players and positions website. <laughs> this is a sample only. Okay, so I had a student who built an exact copy of this. I made them do it again. <laughs> with a marks deduction because they didn't read the instructions. So sample only. You have to build something else that works in a similar way to this. Now, one of the students in the other section said, I don't quite understand why do we need another table here? Why can't we just, why can't I just create a position dropdown and put in, in HTML, the four positions? Most of the time when we have dropdown lists in web applications, the data lives in the database instead of being hard coded into the dropdown list. Why is that? It would work to just put these positions in HTML, but why is it a better idea to have these come from a database instead? Right, because the data can change. So I'll show you a real world example of this. So this is an old website built many years ago, but still keeping it up to date for my clients. Yeah, and Felix, you said it always updates, right? So when I go here, notice there's a whole bunch of dropdown lists. So my customer has categories, and then within each category, right? So once I pick culture, I get these categories. Once I pick sport, I get these. Oh, we've got a typo here. So the data can change, and these dropdowns are not only on the public search page, but they also appear in the private admin area of the site where my customer can manage these things. So because these lists are used in multiple places on the site, it makes much more sense to store them in a database, and that way if we change the data, we don't have to change the list. The lists get updated automatically. If we just hard code them in the HTML, the data, we're gonna to have to find every dropdown list on our site if the data changes. So it's much more efficient to fill our dropdown lists from a table in the database. So in this sample, I would have a positions table and I use a PHP query to fill the list of positions. Okay, so those are the three pages you need. A form, a save page, and then a table page that displays the data. And you have two weeks to do this. I'm just gonna pause my recording. So this would be a sample of what I would be looking for that I would consider to be 100% submission. Um, questions? Anything, it's marked, sorry, good question, Felix. So the marks are here, the rubric is here. Sorry, I didn't show you this. So it's out of 30. So the breakdown is here, two marks for creating your database tables, eight marks for being able to save 
data successfully, eight marks for the queries. So four marks are for building the drop down properly and four marks for building the table properly. Eight marks for the data validation and two marks for using GitHub appropriately, two marks for commenting your code. Up to two bonus marks if you add any additional functionality that shows independent learning with PHP. So this doesn't include doing like JavaScript or CSS. You can show, hey, I've done some extra things with PHP we haven't learned in class. You can get up to a couple bonus marks. So one student, a uh, few students did this. They did added some extra features that they researched on their own. Felix, does that answer your question? Okay, so the rubric is at the bottom of the document. It's on page four. Thanks for mentioning that. I forgot to scroll down. Uh, Hannah, entirely up to you. I'm not marking the CSS, so you don't have to. Um, you could use Bootstrap if you wanted to. You can do your own. Um, I will leave that up to you. So there's no marks for it, so I wouldn't spend a lot of time. If you get it working and finished, you may wanna add some CSS because it's good to have sample projects that you can show when you're out applying for jobs, right? So the more polished your projects look, the better, but it's not required. I will leave that up to you. Colton, I'm just gonna come back to your question as well about the commits. So this was due, um, this was due Monday. So GitHub timestamps it, right? So this student, their last commit was, well, it was 11 minutes after the deadline, which is not a, not a crisis, I would say. So I can see, so they clearly worked on it over a number of days. They started on the 7th, they spent several hours working on it, and then they finished it off the next day by doing a little more work. So GitHub timestamps. So there shouldn't be commits made after the 23rd at five o'clock, but you can make other updates before then. So on Blackboard, when you go to submit, you're simply gonna put in the comments, the GitHub link and the AWS link, that's it. You don't need to upload any files for me. Just add those two links in the comments section on Blackboard. Does anybody else have any other questions about the assignment? Okay. If something else comes up to you during class, that's fine. Um, if you start working on it, you have a question, send me an email. Okay, thanks. Um, but I'm gonna recommend start soon. It's not that big of an assignment, but if you leave it until the very end, it gets pretty late to get help. So the sooner you start, the more time you have to email me or book an office hours appointment for help. Okay, so we want to talk about input validation. I'm going to, let's open up our, open up and launch our PHP gaming site. So I'm going to connect to the VPN as usual. I'm going to go to ZAMP. I'm going to start my Apache web server. So that's Midna, all right, and there's Jinx. That is Quakers, Who's, <laughs> whose pet is Quakers? And there's Tara the Poodle. So we've got Stella, awesome dog name. 
Stella and Charlie. Got another bunny. All right. Thanks for sharing, everybody. That's awesome. It's a great picture, too. Okay, so I'm going to open up my PHP gaming site. So what did we have here, right? So we built our table. So this kind of looks a lot like lab one, and it'll look a lot like your final, the third page of your assignment one, just a simple HTML table. We used bootstrap classes for some basic styling. So I'm gonna to go to the game details page. So there's a few kinds of validation we should be adding here. Um, you know, right now we could, I could just load my game details. Okay, so we actually, we did add required, so that's actually good. And we've used number, but our rating isn't required. So I'll open up the project here. So we've actually done some client side validation already. If we open up this page in the HTML view, Oops, guess I should open up the right project. Um, it's our game details. I'm going to close up my other pages. For now, we're just dealing with game details. So we've added a little bit of HTML5 validation, right? We've said required and that the year had to be a number. And we've made the title also required. Now, if we look at our, we should probably also add a validation on rating, but we're gonna come back to this one in a minute. So we have a little bit of input validation already so we're checking for required fields. We're also checking for numeric data types. What other kinds of input validations might we do when we're building input forms? So we can check for empty values. We can also check for numbers where we should have them, like here. What other kinds of validation do you think we might need to do on different types of input forms? Like let's say it's a registration form. What kinds of validation checks would we need, maybe need to do on a registration? Okay, yeah, we might wanna check that there's no special characters, right. Formatting, absolutely, David. So, you know, an email address has to follow, we might use a regular expression to format an email. Yeah, we'll check for an at symbol. What other kinds of things? on a registration page? What other types of validations would we maybe need to do? Email formatting, checking for special characters. Right, password formats. So typically we check a couple things with passwords, right? One is we check the strength of the password. What other things do we usually check with passwords on a registration page? Yep, the length, that's right. How many password fields do most registration pages have? Yep, Jake, that's right. Yeah, David, that's right. We, we typically have two, why do we have two? Right, because we want users to enter their password twice. So all of those forms are gonna have, that's right here, we're gonna have some kind of password validation that checks that each password needs to be the same, right? So building the forms, our forms isn't very hard, but it's also part of our responsibility to make sure that we try to prevent bad data, garbage data, invalid data in the forms. So we need to add as much validation as we can 
to ensure we're getting good and require the data we need in the right format from our users. It's not enough just to build the form so people can type stuff. We've got to figure out how do we control and limit what they type so that it makes sense for our application, right? If we're building an e-commerce site where people are shopping and we have, let's say, an input like quantity, we need to make sure not only that it's a number, but that it's a whole number, you know, that if somebody can't order 1.5 pizzas, for example, I can only order one or they can order two. So we need to think carefully about the rules we want to implement for validation. Okay, so for now, temporarily, we've already got some validation in our form. I'm going to remove it temporarily. So we've already got client side validation, and this is what I'm expecting you to do in your assignment in your form. You should use HTML5 attributes like required or type to ensure that users don't give you bad data. Felix, if you wanna write JavaScript to do this, you can, but using the HTML5 validator is probably less work. Being efficient is a good thing. Just for now, I'm actually gonna disable the HTML5 validators so that we also, not only do we wanna validate here, but we also wanna validate here. I'm gonna show you why. So right now, if I load this page in the browser, right, there's no way for me to submit this. If I, you know, if I don't have values, and this isn't a number, right, I can't submit. So that's good. So it looks like, okay, well, we've used HTML5 and my form is validated. It is, but it's actually not perfect. I actually could get around this validation and I could still submit a new game with like no title or a release here that looks like this. How could I do this? How could I send invalid data to our save game page? Okay, yes, <laughs> true Felix, but without changing the code, if I was a hacker, so this page is up on the internet. In fact, it is up on the internet, right? I could load it from AWS. I think I've... Um, let's go here. So if I go to my PHP gaming, right, it's actually online. Okay, that's, yep, one option, right, David, right? If I do that, yep. Okay. The other way I could actually submit here is I could use an HTTP program like this one. We're going to use it later, or at least we'll use it next semester. So here's a tool. There's all kinds of tools like this that allow us to make HTTP requests. So watch what happens here. I'm going to open up this program called Postman. I'm going to copy the URL. You don't have to do this. I'm just showing you how somebody could get around the HTML5 input validation we have here. So I can do this. I can make a post request to my save game.php. And I'll put in in my body in the name, yeah, I'll just put in blank spaces. So I can use this tool and I can send a request directly to my save page without ever actually loading the form. So let's see what happens. So I send it, it gives me an okay response and it says, game saved. <laughs> and now if I go and look, 
go back to my games table and refresh. Well, I didn't get anything here, but I could put in invalid data. Like let's say a quantity that's negative. Uh, sorry, a um, not quantity. Uh, I will put in a year and this should actually be title. So when I send it says game saved. And now I have a blank row. So even though my form has validation, I can use a tool like this to send invalid data. So that means our HTML5 validation is good, but we also need to add validation on our save page as well. Right now, it just takes these values and automatically connects to the database and saves. There's no checking here. So just like we've used HTML5 to make sure our title is required and our release here is a number, we also need to check here on the server. So in your assignment, I want you to do the same. In your form, use HTML5 validation. And on the server, before we save to the database, we want to make sure that all the inputs are OK, that we didn't get any junk data. So we want to validate inputs before saving to ensure all data is valid. So we're going to check these one field at a time. So what do we want to check for the game title? We've already done it in the form, but we want to do a, another check here on our save page. David's kind of hinted at it already. Right, we want to make sure that the title isn't empty. So we can do this, we'll say if, and I'll use the exclamation mark, means not, so if not empty, the PHP has a built-in function called empty. Sorry, it should be if, I apologize, if empty. So if our title value is empty, what should we do? So the user calls the save page, but they don't give us a title. What could we do to let the user know? Yeah, <laughs> okay. Yeah, we wanna maybe show the user, exactly. Let's show the user a message. We'll say title is required, and maybe we'll just print out a line break. Yep. With release year, and actually, this doesn't take care of, David made a good point. If the title is a space or series of spaces, um, we're gonna have a problem. <laughs> so we also want to trim it. So we're gonna use trim as well. So we're gonna use trim to remove leading and trailing spaces. So if we take out any spaces at the beginning or end of the title, and then it's empty, we're gonna print a message. For the release year, we wanna check two things. What two things do we wanna check for the release year? Right, so again, we'll check that it's not empty. Um, so if it's empty,
we'll print another message, right? Hey, you got to give us a year, right? And if it's not empty, yeah, we're not, we're, we're not actually asking for a date, Felix, but we're just asking for a year, right, on our form. It's not a date field. It's just a, a, a number. So if it's empty, print a message. Otherwise, and I know in your programming fundamentals with Java, you guys will have done if and else. I'm sure this isn't new. It's exactly the same structure in PHP as it is in Java. So now we want to check for a number. So if it's empty, say it's required. If it's not empty, we now want to check. We can use another function called is numeric. That's self-explanatory. Um, actually, in this case, we want to say if it's not numeric. So we put an exclamation mark in front. Okay, so let's try this out. I'll just upload this to paste of code for you. In case anybody needs it, I'll put the link in the chat. The site wants to load. So we're making sure title's not empty. We're making sure release here is not empty. And we're making sure that release year is a valid number. So here's our validation. I don't know what happened here. Now, in order to test this out, I'm going to modify the game details. We're going to temporarily disable the HTML5 validators. We're just going to take them out so we can check our PHP validation. So I'm going to go to game details. I'm going to take out my required and the type equals number. We'll put them back in in a minute, but we're going to disable them so we can make sure our PHP validation is also working. So I've taken out required in the title. I've taken out required in release year, and I've taken out the type equals number. So there's now no validation on the form. I'm going to reload, and I'm going to leave my form blank and click Save. Now, this is good. It says title is required. It says release year is required. But it also says game saved. So let's go and look at the games. So now it's created this. How come? Why? My page tells me, gives me validation errors, but it still says game saved. How come the game still saved even when it printed out these error messages? It printed out both of these. Why did that happen? Shouldn't we only save if there are no errors? I'm telling the user, look, this was 
you did this wrong and you did this wrong, but then I still saved the data anyway. Colton, you got it, right? We're checking here, but then our code just carries on. <laughs> After we print the messages, we're still connecting, inserting, setting up our parameters and saving. So what could we do? How do we prevent, what will we need to do with all of this code from line 28 down to line 47? All the code we wrote two weeks ago that connects to the database and does an insert. What change, little change should we make to this page so that this code only runs if all the inputs are valid? We need some kind of condition here. Right, okay, Felix, yep, we're gonna need to wrap this in an if statement, that's true. How do we know? So what should the condition be? So above here, I'll put if something, and I'll open a curly brace here and then I'm going to move all of this code from my connection all the way down here. Right, I'll close my curly brace down here now. So we need some kind of condition. This only runs based on some kind of condition. So what condition, what could we check that will tell us whether we should connect to the database and save or not? How do we know if the, anything is wrong? Okay, Felix, we could do it that way. Yes, we could do one if statement that checks all the fields. The challenge is if our form gets big, one in, if statement like that's gonna be hard, difficult to manage. So that would work. I'm wondering if there's a way we could shorten that. It's not wrong. Think there may be a more efficient way. I'll give you a clue. So I'm going to create one more variable here. I'm just going to call it, give it a nice simple name. I'm going to call it OK and I'll give it an initial value of true. Yep, so that's a way of doing it as well. So Felix, we're on a kind of similar mindset. So I'm gonna start okay as true. So what should happen if the title is empty? Right, David, we wanna then change okay. It's no longer true. We've encountered an error. So anytime we print an error message, after all three of these error messages, in each case, we'll say OK is equal to false. So one or more errors, we don't care. As long as there's been at least one error, anytime an error happens with the user input, we're gonna set it to false. So now what's our if statement, what can we check on line 33? How do we use this variable should we save if OK is true or should we save, yeah, if OK is false? So we can just say if OK, or the longhand we could say is equal, equal to true. So it starts off true. We do all our validation checking. If there's no errors, when we get down to here, OK is still true. And then we can connect and save. But if we encounter any errors anywhere along the way, OK becomes false. So when we get to here, 
If OK is false, all of this code gets skipped. There's no need to connect to the database if we don't have valid inputs. So I'm going to try this out now, and then I'll upload the code. We're almost due for a break. So we're now saving if we don't encounter any errors in our validation. So I'm going to go back to my form. Again, I'm going to leave things blank, or maybe I'll even put in an ABC in release year. And now it says the titles required, the year must be numeric. And notice my game saved message, it doesn't appear. If I put in a title, but leave year blank, I only get the error message about the year. Um, if I put in a year, I get no validation errors. I now get a game saved message. So this is the behavior that we're looking for. We're checking each field. We're showing a descriptive message. We want to tell the user what they did wrong very specifically. And only if they've given us all valid data are we going to allow them to save. So if I refresh, my sum game is here, but all my other attempts, they don't get saved. So we're only going to do this if our validation checks find no errors. So in your assignment, you'll need on the save page, you'll need to use PHP to validate and make sure you're only saving if all the inputs are good. Now that this is working, I'm going to put back, I'll just undo in my form. I want both validators though. I want to use HTML5 in my form and I also want to use PHP validation on my save page. So now there's no way for someone to save games if there's no title and not no numeric release year. They're going to be blocked from doing that. OK, it is almost noon. I'm going to upload all my code to GitHub. So if you need it, you can reference it. I'll just go to my terminal. So it's lesson four one input validation. So whenever we're building forms, it's part of our job to make sure we add the proper validation. So here's the link to the repository. That includes all of the new code we've done so far. It is noon, so I'm going to Stop the recording here and let's take a 10 minute break and we'll come back um, at 10 in 10 minutes.